Hi, welcome to the Interaxis channel and Interaxis.io. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Web 3.0. What is Web 3.0? There are a lot of people talking about Web 3.0, especially with the growth of NFTs and DAOs and, and the series that we've done on building DAOs. We want to talk a little bit about Web 3.0, what, what Web 3.0 is. Now remember, Web 3.0 doesn't really have a clear definition. There's not someone who decided here's what Web 3.0 means. Um, there's not uh, a governing body that says here's what it is. We're not even 100% sure what direction it's, it, we, it's going to go, but we do have some ideas of, of what we want to build, and especially based on the technology that we have today, based on the growth we have today, this is kind of where we see Web 3.0 going. Remember, if, if you can, subscribe here, visit us on Twitter, also at Interaxis8. Um, the, the funny thing is, as I say things like that, as I say subscribe, as I say, you know, visit us on Twitter, those are very Web 2.0 uh, applications, very Web 2.0 companies, groups, um, mediums that, that um, our content is getting out there, that we're interacting with people. That's a very Web 2.0. So to get to three, obviously, we have to start with what one and two are. So Web 1... And this is, you know, what I remember fondly from when I, you know, was in college and, and leaving college. This is kind of the beginnings of the Internet. This is where you might have, this is kind of the, the initial dissemination of information. This is where the, the Internet was basically three things. It was newspapers, magazines, whatever, um, putting out their content. So those institutions that instead of sending you a newspaper, they started putting the, their information online. This is when ESPN got, got bigger because now I could get sports information up to date. This is what it was. It was these companies pushing, in, pushing their information on you, but being able to do it in a way that they could never do it before because they didn't need a physical means. It was all digital. Uh, and, and it you know, save them somewhat at cost. They they were not quite sure how to how to drive ad revenue. The thought was just get people to the site. It was all about eyeballs. Get people to the site. Get them to to view things, and then we can sell advertising space. And no one even quite knew how to sell advertising space yet. It was also about the beginning of search engines. Right. This is when the, the initial search engines like Yahoo uh, came out. Um, uh, eventually, Internet Explorer, Netscape was out. Um, you had the beginning, the very beginnings of, of Google understanding that search was going to be a big deal. When you have so much information connected, the, the ability to find it was going to be such a big deal. And so Google came out and had their unbelievable search algorithms that really drove everything else that they've done because they were able to re, you know, simply get people the exact information they need. And eventually that became so far, powerful because then they could target ads. So Web 2.0 was also about the beginning of e-commerce. This is when Amazon started selling things eBay was really big and the the idea was you could turn this this dissemination of information onto people going to a website and buying things so it was the, that beginning of kind of digital marketing get people somewhere where they can actually buy something and there were people that were getting comfortable with the idea of dropping a credit card in and, and and expecting to get something in return expecting to get something that I purchased in return and you know obviously security got uh, much much better in that regard so then we move on to Web 2.0. This is where we start to see the, the ability of interaction on the Internet. It's not one company, one organization pushing things to you. It is now the, the beginning of interaction. So this is where you have the ability to create and upload videos, to create and upload pictures. Others can interact with them. This is where you, you started to see YouTube. Uh, eventually you had Instagram. Of course you have social media like Facebook starting in this period. You have, um, th this is where you have Google Amazon, Apple starting to build these databases that build up this all this data on what we're doing, of course, and figure out how to utilize that data, how to get more targeted, uh, how to use these algorithms to figure out what I really wanted. This is a lot of the essence of Web 2.0, but a big part of Web 2.0 is this interaction, this ability to interact. And what, and what interaction got us was the fact that I can now create this video, I can upload it, and a whole bunch of other people can can view it. This isn't a newspaper or a media company 
deciding they're going to create the video and tell you what it is. It is anybody can now get online. Anybody can create videos or pictures or text or blogs or whatever we want to call them and interact with others. And because of that, when you combine the ability to create with the ability to market and all the data that we have, what this did was it gave gave some people as creators the ability to, to build up an audience and a network and then monetize it. So you have the beginning of this creator economy where those that are in those that are able to create something of value, again whether it's a video or blog or, or whatever it might be, builds up a following or, or create something that is necessary, create something that's valuable or that people want to see and then they can monetize it. And they can monetize it with ad revenue, they can monetize it by selling things, they can monetize it with both, right? There are Instagram influencers and YouTube influencers and, and Twitter influencers that they utilize what they have and they say, okay, once I built up this network, now I'm going to, to monetize it. Again, using quite a bit of the data. Of course, there was data that was being sold. There was Google and Facebook and Amazon and everyone utilizing the data that they could create based on all the things they were doing. This is the era, era when smartphones started. So now that you could, they could essentially track everything we're doing via our websites, via our actual physical movements. Where am I at this moment in time? And therefore, is there something they can send to me, wh whether it's via email or text or just something that randomly pops up, an ad that pops up based on where I am? that is somehow going to drive revenue to someone and therefore you can get a super targeted with the price people pay for ads. So again, we had to go back a little bit and, and talk about the history of Web 1.0, Web 2.0. Web so we still have Web 2.0, we still have a whole bunch of people that are, that are creators. This, is, this also gave us the, you know, from blog we went to, to things like Substack and Patreon where people could take their network and build it and actually charge recurring fees for it, charge subscriptions. So you have a lot of the, the subscription economy, we're going to pay monthly for things and those of us are, are, are those that are kind of in, you know, generation uh, X, Y, Z are used to paying for things monthly and saying, I'm just going to get a subscription to something. Of course, this is when you, you have the um, people cutting the cord, per the, the, the cable cord, right? Because I can get my, my TV, my shows I want to watch through various means, through Netflix and Prime and um, Hulu and all these others. And, and I can I can have it more targeted to what I actually want. So even Netflix and Prime are utilizing the algorithms to figure out what shows to make and then which shows to pitch specifically to me. So it got specific to me, but they had all the control. In in our minds, again, this is somewhat uh, of opinion because not everyone has a, a consensus on what Web 3.0 is. But in our minds, Web 3.0 is going to be much more about control and it's about my having more control over who gets to see what I do, what I have, um, what, what I will do, where I'm going, I'm going to have much more control. And that started with the idea of Bitcoin and blockchain technology and specifically wallet technology because wallets are what give me the ability to control, in that case, my Bitcoin and that's, that's where it started with decentralized finance. So. Keep in mind, Bitcoin kind of exists on this decentralized network where you have all these disparate computers connected, running and managing the Bitcoin network. Of course, I have my wallet here with my private key that I can use. And now technically remember, I don't own Bitcoin. I control the ability to send Bitcoin elsewhere. That's what my wallet gives me, is the ability to control it. Which, if you want to get very theoretical, that's essentially what ownership is. I have the ability to control where something is moved, where it goes. That's what that, that's what my wallet gives me. And Bitcoin started this idea of kind of self-custody, meaning no one else gets to control my Bitcoin. I'm the one who controls it. That makes it censorship resistant. That means someone can't take my Bitcoin from me for in, in any sort of digital sense or in any sort of um, government sense, legal sense, because I'm the one who holds the, the private key. I have the ability to transact through my Bitcoin wallet. Now what that gave us as we moved into decentralized finance and, and NFTs and everything else is saying, okay, we can use that same wallet technology, the, the idea that I have this private key to say, 
now what other data can we store out there? Because essentially Bitcoin is just data, right? Ethereum is just data that, that we put together in a certain way that says this is an, some sort of asset or represents an asset that is valuable. So now with Web 3.0, it's going to be much more about my having more control over what data is out there that pertains to me. Because everything that I do, if I take this particular video and I upload it to something like Odyssey, something that is Web 3.0 based, that doesn't sit on any centralized servers now, because remember YouTube and, and all the other video uh, services sit on centralized servers, which means they can cut me off if they want to for any, anything that, that I violate, if the government says cut it off, if their servers go down, if they get hacked, what, what have you. But when I upload the video and it's on all these decentralized computers that are processing these transactions, of course, some of these computers can go down, my video is still up. I also get to control, if I want to, who sees it. I get to control it by virtue of my wallet. No one else really gets that level of control. I'm the one who does it. I can also decide how I'm going to get paid for it. There might be others over here viewing this video, and they might decide to, to tip me or something so I can earn I can earn that way and I can be a creator that way because I say, look, I'm going to take whatever my content is, and this is where you get into the content, the creator economy. I can take whatever my content is, whether it is videos like this, it could be blog posts like we see on Mirror, it could be music like Royal just raised a, a good deal of money to start offering NFTs uh, of music, meaning I can put my music out there on chain if I want to. I can allow others to buy pieces of it. They can own and control pieces of, of, the, of the revenue, of the royalties that come from my music, and therefore I, as the creator, can make some money. I'm not uploading it to you know, an, an Amazon server, an Apple server, anything like that. I have the ability to control who sees it if I'm the, the creator. I also have the ability, if I want to, to buy a piece of someone else's music and now I'm the one who controls that income stream potentially or I might be able to control what happens with that particular music. So Web 3.0 is going to be very much about control. We've already seen it with cryptocurrency. We've already seen it with decentralized finance. What it does is what, what we, where we see it in DeFi or, or crypto or, or, or whatever is I have my wallet, it could be a MetaMask wallet, it could be a hard wallet, whatever it might be, and I'm interacting with DeFi, meaning I'm taking some sort of funds, right? This could be you know, DAI, it could be USDC, and by virtue of the fact that I have the private key, I tell my DAI, I want you to go to Aave and be deposited for whatever I'm earning. This, none of this, of course, goes through a bank. This doesn't go through any sort of central custodian or anything. I'm the one making these decisions. I decide when it goes in, I decide when it comes out, and the, whatever I'm earning goes straight into my wallet. Where we are helping financial advisors, we're letting them see this is going to be the new version of custody. You're gonna to have to understand how this works for your, your clients because they're going to be the ones that are now in control. And being in control is positive, on many, is positive in many respects. It's positive in that I get to control what happens with my money. I, I, I get to, um, I'm not worried about some you know, centralized custodian go, you know, going down. It, it works 24-7, 365, all those great things. But it also means now I'm fully at, at risk, meaning if my wallet gets hacked, my private key gets hacked, if I do something wrong and, and lose my funds, then it's gone and there's no one to call. There's no 800 number to call, so it's good and bad. What it also means is my wallet, that same wallet that I use, whether it's MetaMask or, or Ledger or Trezor or, or it, you know, a phantom wallet on Solana or something, I'm controlling not only my money, because remember, this is just data. We've just put it together in a way that it has some sort of value. But I can control other data and other information and when, or, or when I might want to share it. So I might control something about my employment history. And when I submit to go get a, a job, I submit for a job or working for a DAO or something, I can decide what I tech, 
technically what I want those people to be able to see. And I might say, look, I want you to be able to see these you know, DeFi um, transactions I made. Or I want you to be able to see some of the mirror posts I wrote and some of the videos I've done. And so I'm going to choose whether or not I want to share those with you. Again, that doesn't happen right now, but it can. It could also be, as, and we've talked about this before, something like health data. So my health information, my health data might exist now no longer at some, you know, at my doctor's office or the hospital servers, but it's going to exist in this decentralized web now. That data is just going to be out there in different pieces in the web. And I'm going to decide who gets to see it by virtue of my wallet. I might give a certain doctor the ability to see some of this health information. I might give an insurance company the ability to see some of this information, but not all of it. Because I'm now in control of it. I'm in control of my identity, which means I'm in control of, of my health information. I'm in control of my employment information. Possibly something like credit. Possibly something like education. I'm no longer going to have to ask permission to get this data to go send it to someone else. I'm no longer going to have to get permission to get, to, to get my um, things like my diploma. I'm going to have that as some sort of certificate, some sort of token that represents this, and then I'm going to get to choose how I share that with others. So Web 3.0, in our minds, is about having more control. It is about not ceding control to the, the third parties that have been running the, the video systems or the chat systems or the Twitter or the, the blogs or whatever. It's not necessarily ceding control to Facebook and Amazon to be able to take all that data. It's saying, no, no, I'm now going to control my data. I'm going to control what others see. I'm going to control how I monetize that. If I want you to be able to see all my information, what I'm doing, what I'm browsing, then you have to pay for it, but you have to pay me directly. That's what BAT is. That's what the Brave browser does, is it says, I'm not going to see an ad unless I choose to, and if so, someone's going to have to pay me for the ability to, to show me that ad. So Web 3.0, I, I know we didn't go into too much detail, but is going to be much more about my, as the consumer, as the user, as the producer, as the creator, whatever it might be, having much more control. We got used to in Web 2.0. Web 2.0 was great for getting people to understand that they could be the creators. They could be the people producing their own content. I don't have to go work for a magazine or a newspaper. I can just start writing. I don't have to go work for a TV station. I can just make videos. I don't have to work for a radio station. I can create a podcast and then I can figure out how to monetize it. That's very Web 2.0. And people learned how to do that. And then they said, you know what? I want to have more control over all this. We have the technology to be able to put that information, that data, those videos or blogs or whatever on chain and then I have to be able to control it. And the way I'm going to control it is all going to be through wallets. It's all going to be through private keys and wallets and deciding who gets to see what, how I might get paid, what I own, what I'm going to do with the things that I own or the things that I control, which could be cryptocurrency, it could be NFTs, it could be security tokens, it could be something that represents royalties or a watch or my house or my health information. That is what Web 3.0 is going to be. It's going to be about using your identity, using your, your digital wallet to be able to control data. And that data, again, can be financial. It can be ownership. It can be royalties. It can be my health information, my education, the things that I've done in the past. And that's what's going to give me the ability to, to pursue other options, pursue other opportunities through work, pursue other opportunities, creativity, investing, uh, financially, banking, all of those things are, are going to be summed up by the fact that I now have more control over everything. Some people say that's, that's really ownership, but if you really want to take a step back, it's more about my having control over my stuff my data, my information, my, my history, my uh, finances, my assets, all of that is my having control by virtue of a, of a wallet, a uh, private key, and then the ability to decide what to do with it. So I hope this is a, a little bit helpful. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you'll subscribe. Follow us on Twitter at Interaxis8, and we'll see you in the next video.